Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today for our presentation, um, Sexuality and Disability. And today it's being presented by the wonderful Sofia Cervantes from State Council on Developmental Disabilities. Thank you for being here. Um, Family Focus uh, Resource Center welcomes you. We love having Sofia. We love having State Council do these presentations for us. We're very lucky um, because they have so much information and Sofia is a wonderful presenter. Um, so thank you so much, Sophia, for being here today. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. It's good to be here with you all. Um, good morning. As um, it was said, my name is Sophia Cervantes, and I'm with the State Council on Developmental Disabilities. We are a state advocacy agency, um, and so we provide support to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, as well as their families, by answering questions, by providing training on topics that seem to interest the community. Um, and we also work on systemic change, so making changes to laws, to policies, to regulations that impact um, access to services or quality of services for uh, people and individuals with disabilities. Okay, so today we will be discussing the topic of sexuality and um, disability. Okay, first I want to let you all know that on the chat, you will see um, a link where when you press it, I'm gonna share on my screen very quickly, um, you will have access to the presentation and other materials through this link. Um, whenever you, as long as you keep this link, you'll have access to this at all times. So there is um, an English and Spanish folder because as it was mentioned, we did this presentation in Spanish yesterday. So if you press English, you'll be able to access the presentation here with a little star. You'll be able to access the presentation here. You could go ahead and print it. You can download it onto your computer. I've also put a few other resources. This flyer here uh, gives you access to all of our materials on a range of uh, topics. So you could feel free to look at that resource. Our agency also provides trainings every Monday at 10 a.m. One Monday it's in English, the other Monday the topic is repeated in Spanish. Um, in April and May, we will be focusing on a special education series, which I know is usually a very hot topic. Um, so please feel free to join us again every Monday at 10 a.m. This Zoom information remains the same all year. So you could go ahead and keep this meeting ID and password and come in any and every Monday at 10 a.m. and check out the topic, see if we're doing English or Spanish and feel free to stay or, you know, log off as, as needed. But we're about to start this, uh, you know, special education series and it's gonna be good. Okay, so you have that link on the chat. So today we're gonna be speaking as I mentioned, on sexuality and disability. And um, this is a topic that is sometimes not discussed as widely, sometimes with the community of individuals with disabilities. One, sometimes we tend um, to speak about it less. And sometimes we may even perceive that it is recognized by them less. And so it kind of becomes a non-topic, sometimes because of cultural reasons, right? Sexuality, it's kind of a taboo and we don't talk about it. And so we hope with today's presentation that this becomes a topic that you consider, right? And that you, that we may become more comfortable with and that you may uh, open that up more as a conversation in your household, and especially with your son or daughter or loved one with a disability. And when we look at this topic, we really are looking at one, the human rights part of it, right? That we all have the right to experience life to its fullness. And a big part of humanity is our sexuality, right? And by sexuality, it doesn't necessarily mean actual sex, right? It's the topic as a whole. It's the consideration um, that also being aware of our sexuality means 
that this can be preventative of abuse, of sexual abuse, right? Uh, we've seen statistics where also uh, human trafficking, right, is increasing. And so this topic in general is for the sake of those things, for the human right part of it, right, that we all have a right to know ourselves and experience our bodies and know how we want to interact with uh, other individuals, and then the preventative part in terms of abuse and sex trafficking. Okay, so to sort of get us started on this um, concept of sexuality, I would like us to um, do an activity. And on the chat, I am going to put here if you would check the chat so i am going to share a screen if you have your phone available then you will be able to just hold up if you um open your camera and let me switch just a little bit so if you open your camera you'll be able to access um what we're looking at through this qr code if you are not able to do it through your phone, you could go ahead and minimize the Zoom window if you're using your phone for Zoom. And then go ahead and go to a search engine and type www.menti.com. -E and then it'll ask you for a code. And the code is 9639680. Okay, everybody good? Everybody can see that on the screen? Awesome. Okay. All right. So again, I'd like to get some questions, you know, some uh, information from you all just to know who's in the room and, and also just to get us thinking of the topic and know our own perceptions about this topic. Okay, so we'll go to the first question. How old is your loved one with a disability? And if anyone needs to use the chat, you can also do that, okay? And if you notice on the screen, you'll be able to see people's responses, okay? So I see 26, 21, 18 and 27, 17, 31. You've got three 17 year olds, 14, 14. Very good. I'll give it a little more time. Okay. 33, 13. Good. So regardless of the age of your loved one, know that this is a great timing for this conversation. I see there's a nine-year-old, right? Good timing for that conversation. I think the more aware that we are earlier on, then the more that even you as a parent could feel comfortable for when the time comes when you feel that these conversations need to take place, okay? All right, and I see 18, 19, and nine on um, the chat. Okay, and we'll go to the next question. Okay, and the question is, what word or words come to mind when you see the word sexuality? What words or word comes to mind when you see the word sexuality. And again, you can type in the chat too if that's more accessible. Okay, sex. Okay, both responses, sex, sexual identity, orientation, gender ID, dating, caution, expression, options. Good words. And again, if you see on the screen, you'll be able to see um, other people's responses. I see dating on the chat. Give it a few more seconds. Energy, okay. Dating, okay, very well. Everyone deserves, okay. Okay. 
pleasure, I see on the screen. Life. Okay. Very good. All right. Next question. How much do you think your loved one knows about sexuality? Nothing, a little, a lot. Okay, most respondents are saying a little. I see on the screen also a little. Okay, and one person says nothing. I'll give it a little more time. A little. On the chat, we have one person who says nothing. Not much. Okay. So most people, a little, we would say. All right. Next question. I think my loved one has feelings of attraction toward others. True, false, not sure. Five people right away say true. I see true, true on the on the chat. <laughs> Someone answered 100%. <laughs> okay. Okay. This one looked pretty unanimous. True. We keep getting responses and it's true, true. Okay. Next question. I think that my loved one can have intimate physical relationships. They have the ability to. I think that my loved one can have intimate physical relationships. Uh, the choices would be yes at the right time, no, never, not sure. Okay, a few not sure. Mostly yes at the right time. On the chat, someone said absolutely at the right time. And a few not sure. Okay. Okay. Next question. I think that my loved one wants to have intimate physical relationships. A few right away answered yes, yes, yes. Okay, looks pretty unanimous, yes. Okay, one person answers, I don't think he, and pardon me, I don't think he, she knows about that. Okay, someone else answered on the chat, of course. Okay. Next question. I would like for my loved one to get married one day. True, false, not sure. Okay. On the chat, I see someone saying, not sure. A few not sure. This might be pretty split between true and not sure. I see another yes on the chat. Okay. This one's a little bit split. Next question. I would like for my loved one to have children of his or her own one day. Someone quickly replied yes. Another not sure. Another false. Okay. Not sure. There's probably the most diversity in our answers for this question. And these might be tough questions to consider. Okay. Pretty split between true, false, and not sure. 
Last question. What feelings do you experience when you think about your loved one being in a romantic relationship? Fearful, concern, nervous, fear of being taken advantage of, taken advantage of, worry, nervous, happy. Happy, I want him to experience love and romance, but it comes with a lot of challenges. Happiness. I'll give it a few more seconds here. Okay. So fearful a few times on the screen here. Happiness. He would be a great partner. But where is the right girl? Okay. And on the uh, chat, I see exciting, but fearful at the same time. Someone else answers, a lot of concerns, wanting for him to have a chance like anyone else. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you for your participation in that. It's, I think, helpful to... Um, even know a little bit more of what we think and what we perceive and what's really on our minds at the time about the topic. Okay, so let me quickly now share the presentation. Awesome. And someone says, love this interaction. Awesome. Me too. <laughs> I love this platform. I love that we get to see everyone's responses. Right, and you get to see the differences in opinion and the differences in how we feel about things. Um, so sexuality and, and disability, when we talked about um, you know, what comes to mind when um you think of sexuality, right? And someone on there put energy and indeed, right? And and others put sex, right? You think sexuality, I'm thinking sex. I'm thinking intercourse, the actual act. Someone said passion. Someone said, um, forgetting a few of them, but, but a person said um, energy and indeed, right? Sometimes because we associate only sex with sexuality or vice versa, we associate sexuality as only being sex, Sometimes we consider that this is a topic to be explored if and when, right, they're, they're into adulthood. But in reality, right, sexuality begins at the time of birth, being that we are born as reproductive beings, right? So sexuality begins from day one. And indeed, as someone mentioned on, you know, during the activity, that sexuality can be described as an energy, right? That we all have. Now, just like we all manage a different type of energy, we also get to manage and decide how to express and explore this sexuality energy, right? But indeed, sexuality is an energy, an energy that is felt by all, right, in energy that must be managed. And when it's not, it may come out in different ways. And because it's an energy, the truth is that it's it manifests and it's expressed in more ways than just the act of having sex, right? So even when, you know, you wake up in the morning and perhaps ladies, gentlemen, right? When you wake up in the morning and you're deciding what to wear, you know, maybe you're like, I'm feeling like wearing heels today, right? I'm feeling a really red lip today. A lot of makeup. I'm feeling like doing my hair. It may feel indirect, but it's one way of releasing certain sexual energy, right? Without necessarily the sex part but it's an energy that's being released. Maybe when you walk down the street and someone compliments your outfit, 
someone says, oh, you look good, girl, or sometimes uninvited compliments, right? Maybe a little bit odd of a compliment by someone else. But regardless, certain sexual energy is released through that. Sometimes we see that it's released even in ways that seem non-related, like road rage, right? You have the opportunity to release energy in different ways, right? How many times have we not seen, maybe even, you know, even if just in movies where there's a group of girls gathered around or there's a group of guys gathered around and someone passes by and they kind of right? They kind of start looking at the person and they kind of have that interaction and they are releasing that energy through talking about it, through looking, through making contact, right? Whenever someone is in a relationship, maybe a new relationship, and they see the person's name on their phone, right? Whether it's through Instagram or gosh, so many platforms now, right? TikTok, Twitter, right? They see their name come up and they're like, Oh, someone contacted me, right? Someone of interest. And there is an energy that is released with that interaction, right? When it's in the morning and maybe they text, oh, they are asking what I'm eating and what I'm watching and oh, they care. All those interactions are a way that that energy is released, right? And it's part of development. It's part of what we all encounter, right? It could be said, however, that with individuals with disabilities, sometimes even those interactions and the opportunity for those interactions are somewhat, if not a lot, reduced. Sometimes because of intellectual capacity, right? Their, their um, intellectual, their cognitive understanding, sometimes because of limited communication, and limited social interactions, they may have no natural outlet for this energy that we all experience. Sometimes depending on their level of independence, maybe they have a support staff all the time, every day, all day, right? And so there really isn't any privacy, there really isn't any interaction that feels natural with peers. So again, less opportunity to experience and express that energy. And then the environment, right? Again, usually some individuals with disabilities, right? They may always be in a very protected environment. Lots of staff, lots of oversight, lots of, and not as many peers, not as many natural interactions, not as many opportunities to do the flirting, intentional or unintentional, very direct or non-direct, right? Um, here, you want to borrow my pencil, right? All these interactions that we think of or that we could think of, of even when we were younger, right? Those interactions are ways that unseemingly, right, we release energy, this specific sexual energy. But again, with individuals with disabilities, the opportunities for that expression and that release and the manifestation of that energy is very much reduced. And much more when maybe caretakers or loved ones who support us, right, do not open that conversation or create opportunities for that social interaction, right? And so um, if you'd like to answer on the chat, you can. Um, but sort of just questions for you to consider and, and think about, you know, how do you see this energy maybe manifested in your son or daughter, right? Have you ever noticed maybe the look, the, the, the eye contact lingers a little long when someone that they seem attracted to passes by? Right. Maybe if the person approaches a little, I see some nodding. Right. Maybe when the person approaches, maybe the way they move their body, maybe the way where they place their hands when someone passes by that they seem to be attracted to. Right. So, you know, do you observe behaviors that may be related to this energy? Perhaps sometimes even aggression. Right. I, in my humble experience, right before being an advocate, I provided direct support to individuals uh, with intellectual and developmental disabilities, 
primarily autism and also um, for individuals who had a co-occurring uh, diagnosis like autism and bipolar disorder or autism and, and um, other mental health conditions. But so a lot of the individuals I worked with were nonverbal, right? And in my experience, whenever that combination, right, they have a diagnosis, they're nonverbal, um, there seemed to be the release of that energy came through aggression. Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Didn't get have enough time to mute there. Um, so it, it almost seemed that with the sexual frustration, the way that that manifested was through aggression. Because sometimes if we don't provide outlet for all that frustration or even that knowledge of knowing what's happening with my body, why am I feeling what I'm feeling and what should I do? What am I supposed to do with this energy, right? Then that can build up to aggression. That can build up to them experiencing frustrations in ways that we may not be attributing it to the fact that they need to know more about their body and need to know a little bit more of how to manage, right? Whatever that means, how to manage that sexual energy. I do want to say right off the bat, right, that as we explore this topic, oh, this is part of what's hard. There isn't a formula for how to do this right right? It's very person-centered. It's based on what the person wants. And it also depends, how does your family feel about the expression of sexuality, right? What is your culture, your beliefs? There's a spectrum of that. So you get decide, you get to decide what's appropriate for your family, what message you want to pass on to your son or daughter. But the thing is, right, just like with other things, they are going to know about it from somewhere, right? I don't know if you've been, you know, if you've encountered this, I know I have an eight-year-old niece and, um, you know, sometimes she mentions things and I'm like, how, do, how does she know that, right? So whether we talk about it at home, it's gonna be spoken about somewhere, right? So as a caretaker, as a parent, then perhaps you might say, well, I'd rather be the one who gives that message. I'd rather be the one to be able to influence what I might think is appropriate and not appropriate within this topic, right? And so you get to decide that. What we hope today is that you can have a menu, you can have a full, um, a fuller concept of the topic, different options of what to do, and then consider what is appropriate for yourself, okay? But indeed, right, sexuality, again, we're saying is an energy experienced by all. And when we talk about puberty, which is said to begin between 9 and 16 years old for girls and 10 to 18 for boys, right, then we recognize their body is going to encounter changes or their body already did, right, and they may not know, right? So sexuality is part of everyone's development and just the way that we learn about how to use other parts of our body, right? Like our eyes, our mouth, our hands, our feet. We even have occupational therapists to teach us how to use our, right, our body parts, right? Sometimes we don't educate enough about other body parts like our reproductive parts, right? What are they for? What do they experience? What is this about? And the truth is that when we don't, educate around that topic, we are at times making them more vulnerable to abuse, right? Because if we are not conversing about appropriate touch, what are your private parts, right? What kind of touch is okay, especially with individuals with disabilities that need physical support. Sometimes they're being touched very much, to be, to be provided support. So how to distinguish appropriate touch from inappropriate touch? Maybe they do need help um, when they go to the restroom, right? And they do need help with wiping. Well, they're touching my private parts, but what's the difference between appropriate and not welcomed physical touch, right? And 
then how do we advocate for what am I okay with and what I'm what I'm not okay with when individuals are verbal and nonverbal, right? How are we teaching and what can I do to teach my son or daughter, even if they're nonverbal, of how to reject touch that doesn't feel appropriate? But again, without the fuller conversation of body parts, physical awareness, and awareness of this energy and what you're going to feel, then that might be very hard to manage for someone who doesn't know what's happening in their body, right? And also keeping in mind that puberty includes a whole lot of changes, right? Skin texture, right? Maybe breakouts, right? Sweat glands change, right? You just need to walk into a locker room to, to know that, right? Sweat glands, body hair, height, facial structure and features, the voice, right? I remember I, I saw a young um, boy recently and I hadn't seen him in a very long time. And he was like, oh, so, you know, it was like three octaves lower. And I was like, whoa, okay, it hit. Puberty's come indeed, right? His voice sounded so different. The development of body parts, right? The beginning of menstrual cycle, body functions, hormones, emotions, right? Communication changes, identity. Someone put that as we did the activity, right? Sexual orientation, identity, attraction, right? All of these things to consider about our development and yet sometimes not much guidance, right? Not much guidance and not much presentation of the gamut of information that is important to have in order for one to contemplate, well, what do I like, right? How do I feel with this person? Am I attracted, right? Is this friendship or is it romantic? Isn't that the question, <laughs> right? Considering that these topics themselves are difficult with a disability or without a disability. Relationships as they are can be difficult navigating the dating world, navigating splitting, what splits friendship from romantic, right? How do how would I feel if this was romantic? How do I know that this is just a friendship? As it is, these are things that could be complicated for anybody, right? So even more than recognizing there need to be conversations about this, right? So some questions to consider, you know, what changes have you noticed in your son or daughter? What reaction have they had to their own changes? When we're talking about individuals with disabilities, some individuals have a really hard time with change. So can we imagine how difficult it's going to be to see their own body change and not know that it's coming? I know I worked with a seven-year-old who became very afraid when his voice changed, right? And so he almost became nonverbal for a few weeks. He didn't want it. He wasn't ready. Like, what is happening with my voice, right? For others, it was the growth of hair in places where they hadn't seen that before. They got a little bit frightened, right? Girls, when they begin their menstrual cycle, right? Not knowing what to do, not knowing the hygiene related to that. All those are skills that if spoken about the earlier the possible, and I'm seeing this for the um, ones that have the younger children, right? The earlier these conversations happen, maybe the better, right? They're more prepared. We prime them, we prepare them for other things. Why not for this, right? This requires same attention, if not more, okay? So what's important as we step into this step-by-step -step conversations, right? Creating that space to be able to tell them, hey, what do you know about this, right? And what do you think this is? Whatever, however the topic may begin, right? But kind of getting from them first what they think about something, right? And then step by step, giving them information, identifying body parts, right? Identifying body parts using the appropriate anatomical words, right? And also educating them on the slang or the, the words that are sometimes used in reference to body parts. And the reason we say this is one, it's important 
medically for their health and safety for them to know the terminology, the health-based terminology, right? When they're reporting to a doctor, when they're reporting about what hurts, et cetera. But for abuse prevention, it may be very important for them to also know the terminology that is commonly used or the street talk or the slang for the following reason. I heard of a young um, girl who she knew the anatomical word of her breasts, right? But she didn't know that there was slang that was used to reference to a woman's breast. And so she was at school and there was a young boy who approached her and asked, can I touch? But he used a word that wasn't breasts, right? And so she wasn't familiar with that word and oh, uh, yeah? Like, sure, you can touch. She wasn't aware of what that was. And so, of course, it was very shocking when he approached and touched her breast, right? So with this to say, maybe it's important whenever you think the age is appropriate, right, to educate on not just the anatomical label of our, of our body, but also other words that their peers may use, other words that people may use in reference to their body parts. And again, this is with the hope of abuse prevention or abuse reporting, right? That if they don't even know that there was something that was wrong, they may never talk about it. As it is, abuse is reported at low numbers for many different reasons, right? Much more if the person doesn't know, well, that may have felt a little strange, but I don't know if that was bad or not, right? And so they, they may have less of a reference for that. Okay, and having open communication. If there isn't a culture of communication in our home, then when we have to talk about this topic that is a little bit more private, more intimate, a little bit like, oh, I might be shy to talk about it, then if we don't already have that culture of communication, we may find that the likelihood of our children, our loved ones sharing about this topic may minimize, right? Because there isn't that um, that tradition, that, that custom time of communicating, right? So whenever, you know, and, and we relate this to ourselves, right? If there's a person that we just talk about, you know, if, if we never even talk about, hey, how was your day? How's the weather? And, oh, I like that shirt. If we don't even have that kind of conversation, then you better believe I'm not going to talk about things that are more private, right? And sometimes when individuals are nonverbal, we tend to also become nonverbal, it seems, right? We talk about things less. We may not even ask about their day, right? So I may want to create, think about creating this culture of open communication. Tell me one good thing that happened at school today. Tell me one thing that you didn't like that happened at school today. Let these questions become customary, right? That they become the norm every day. This is what I'm going to communicate about, right? So allowing for that to happen. And then for us to consider what might be the best way, very person-centered, what might be perfect for my son or daughter to talk about their body. Might you use pictures, right? Such as these, right? Might you use pictures? Might you use videos, books? Then determining who's going to speak to my son or daughter about this, right? Sometimes if there's uh, two partners in the household, sometimes if um, it's a young girl, then they'll say, well, mom will talk to her right? The female in our household will speak to her. Sometimes if it's a male, then we leave that job to the male, right? But deciding who's going to talk about it, right? And we still need to be on the same page so that we can send similar messages, right? So making plans for what tools do I need, right? For um, talking about this topic, consider the fact that for some individuals, pictures and, and you know, uh, icons like this may be helpful for others. Um, I know I worked with a young boy who had a difficulty associating that what we were showing him on a picture was in reference to his own body. He had a difficulty generalizing that information. 
So for him, he needed a picture of himself, right? He needed to look at himself or use his own body to say, these are where my parts are. Because for him, that part of translating the image to, oh, okay, you're pointing to his arm, but you're talking about my arm. You're pointing to his private areas, but you're talking about mine, right? That was a little bit difficult. And so for him, particularly, it was most beneficial for him to take a picture of himself, right? With some clothing, right? But to be able to point to himself and say, this is where my chest is. This is where my penis is. This is where, right, to actually talk about his body. So you get to consider, you know, what kind of tools are going to be helpful when talking about this topic, okay? And then finding appropriate and natural moments to talk about these things and considering involving other family members. Let's say that you're a younger or an older daughter is now developing in her breasts and now she needs to wear a bra, right? Maybe that's a natural moment where we can talk about this, right, together, <clears throat> okay? Use appropriate and individualized support, as we mentioned, age-appropriate resources, review their options based on their age, and we're going to get into that in just a little bit. But sometimes the task that we have is presenting the range of information. Sometimes we have these quick responses, right? And I know when I was younger and when I worked with families, I would hear moms say, well, um, girls only have babies when they're married, okay? And then an artist on TV right? They announce she's pregnant, she's having a baby girl, and they know that they're not married, and now there's confusion. Or their cousin is pregnant, and we know that she never was married, and now it's like, wait, I thought you said you could only have babies when you're married, right? So all these things that sometimes we just kind of blur out and say, but in fact, they don't really make sense, or they don't capture the essence of what really goes on in real life, that can be confusing, Right. So even presenting the information of there's different scenarios where um, uh, where people can have babies. Right. Some individuals, some girls may choose to have a baby without a husband. Right. Sometimes people adopt a baby. They don't have it in their own belly. They adopt a baby. Sometimes people live together and have babies. Sometimes they live apart and they have babies. Sometimes they get married and then have a baby. Right. And then you get to influence and say, in our house, we think that this is the better way to go, right? But this is what happens in the world, right? And you now get to choose what do you think are the pros and cons of each of these options, right? Going through that mental rehearsal to help them make a choice and be conscious of why might you be advising them to do it one way versus another, right? But not just teaching my way, as if there's no other ways, because then that can be a little bit confusing, right? When they see something else happen and they're like, wait, mom, dad never talked about this, right? They said this only happens within this scenario. And now I'm looking at a scenario that doesn't fit the criteria that mom and dad put, right? So what are the options of sexual expression, right? What are the options? And then what does your culture, what do your beliefs, what does your family believe? You can teach that, right? And educate your son or daughter on the options and then the option that you feel your family um, thinks is appropriate, okay? What questions do you think your son or daughter may have? Sometimes this is the best way to start the conversation and it doesn't mean you have to have the conversation in one city right? Hey, I've been thinking about this topic, right? I know that people use the word sex. I know that people use the word whatever. What do you think that means? And what questions do you have about that, right? And I might write them down. I might write them down on my phone, okay? Because I want to make sure that I could give you information to the questions you have. If I can make a plan for that, right? And not necessarily be ready with an answer, it's okay if we don't have all that conversation in one sitting again, right? Maybe the first step is to explore what they know and to explore what questions they have. 
and then give yourself some time to process that, <laughs> right? And to maybe recognize, oh man, I thought they knew a little, but they knew a whole lot, right? Based on their questions, they know a lot more than I thought. And so it's important to, to pace that, right? What questions do you not feel ready to answer, right? And even here, I may ask, what perception do you have of sexuality and sex? If there has been abuse in your background, in your life, then that itself may make you less comfortable talking about this topic. And that itself is important to recognize because maybe we need some help to have this conversation. We're going to talk about this a little bit later, but maybe this is where Regional Center comes in and they provide a service to be able to educate your son or daughter on the topic. Maybe you recognize I may need some counseling. I may need some um, someone to talk to about things that I've experienced sexually. And that's why I am biased about certain things. And I don't want, even want to explore this topic. That's why I answered. Maybe you're one of the ones that answered. I don't know if I want them to have kids. I don't know if I want them to have a significant other. I don't know if they want them to be married. Because maybe there's some trauma in your background that's influencing your message about sex and sexuality, okay? And I see a, a hand raise. Thank you very much for your question. If I can ask, um, because we are recording, if you wouldn't mind writing your question on the chat or feel free to leave your hand up and I will make sure to call on you first um, as soon as we go into the question portion of our presentation, okay? But thank you for your question. Please feel free to write it on the chat and I'll remember to call on you first, okay? Um, and we're only doing this for the sake of everyone's privacy because this is being recorded, okay? So something to consider, right? Consider your own views on gender, gender identity, on attraction, on orientation, because it will guide how you talk about these things, okay? Another very important thing to, to explore is, right, how am I talking about boundaries? OK, um, this can get complicated very quickly. Right. First, let me explain what we're looking at is um, social rules and expectations. This model is called social circles. And as you see, the social circles, what they indicate is the person in the middle, then the family in the next circle, then the friends in the following circle, then acquaintances and then service contacts or agencies like service providers, and then strangers. So the idea is that this image, concrete image, this visual would help you talk about what behaviors are okay for you to engage in with yourself here in the middle, with your family members versus your friends versus acquaintances versus et cetera, right? So you may explore here with family members, what is your family okay with, right? Do you guys greet each other with a hug, with a kiss, with a kiss on the lips? Some cultures, they do just the cheek. Some cultures do the hand, the lips. What is okay? What physical contact is okay for your family members, right? Now, keeping in mind that there is immediate family and then extended family. Sometimes we impulsively say, hey, come and hug your uncle, right? Give him a hug, give him a kiss. When what we are learning, right, as time goes on is that that sometimes, excuse me, limits our children from making choices about the kind of physical contact that they feel okay with, with family members, right? So instead of me approaching or giving a direction about how to greet any person, I may say, hey, the different greetings are, you can give someone a hug, you can give someone a kiss on the cheek, you can shake someone's hand, you can high five them, you could wave, you could put a thumbs up, hi, right? What We're about to go say hi to your uncle and maybe I have a visual chart of all the ways that people could greet right? And maybe I have a visual chart and I say, we're going to go greet your uncle, right? 
How do you want to say hi to him? These are your options. And they may point to a hug. If they point to a hug, wonderful, cool. If they point to a high five, then respecting that, right? And saying, okay, we're going to greet them with a high five. Let's go say hi to your uncle. Hey, uncle, Richie wants to say hi to you with a high five, okay? And bridging that gap. Because again, sometimes what happens is we don't give them um, enough opportunity to explore how do they feel around people and we don't send the message you have the choice of how you want to bring your body in proximity to someone else. And again, especially it, with individuals with disability, sometimes those, those lines get blurred. And so then when uncle or aunt or cousin touches me in a certain way, well, I'm not really used to making choice about how people touch my body. So I guess this is okay, right? Versus creating this culture of self-advocacy and expression and choice making, right? That I can make a choice about how I want this, this autonomy of this is my body and I get to share it the way that I think is appropriate, right? And so sometimes we may give certain directions and that may be confusing. And let me, I guess, explain. So sometimes we may say, hey, don't talk to strangers, okay? However, we as adults talk to strangers all the time, right? We may be at the store and we don't, we don't talk to strangers. And then the lady in front who you've never seen who should be is categorized under the stranger category, right? You oh nice bucket. Oh, where did you get that? Right? You're talking to her. That's confusing, right? So then using something concrete like this to be able to express, right? And to be able to differentiate what physical behavior is okay depending on the circle that we're at. Right now. Keep in mind that this also could be very helpful in protecting their self-esteem. And what do I mean by that? There are times where maybe if they have learned that we hug family members, sometimes we may grab them, right? And just kind of put our head next to them. That's sweet and appropriate for family members. But if they don't know the difference of these social circles and they go do that to a peer, one, it may not be welcomed. And they may take it as harassment, one. Two, they may get bullied because of the lack of awareness of social boundaries, right? You know, why are you hugging me? That's weird for teenagers, right? So uh, by us teaching these social rules, we really are, one, preventing, you know, uh, the goal is to prevent abuse, but also, two, we're protecting their self-esteem so that their peers, you know, it's not like they don't know the social rules and they get bullied because of the lack of awareness, okay? So um, someone on the chat was asking, thank you for the question, regarding sexuality, safe relationships, education, are there resources? I have requested this service from my regional center over a year. They don't have vendors providing the service any leads. So a comment to that, very, very important, um, is keep in mind that when we speak about regional center, right, the law says that individuals have the right to receive services based on their needs. Another part of the law also says that services are meant to ensure a person's health and safety, okay, increase their independence, integrate them in the community and keep them in the least restrictive environment. Okay, those pe those that piece of information is, is in the law, which then means that if your son or daughter, for the sake of their health and safety, they need sexual education, okay, and there aren't other resources on the outside, like the school, like your health insurance that provides this service that they need, then the regional center has the responsibility of developing a service to meet your need. Yesterday, this question for the Spanish group, this question came up. And one of the comments that we made, one, 
And this goes into a whole other topic. So please feel free to maybe we could talk at the end or feel free to contact me on the side. But one, this requires that that uh, we request an IPP meeting to talk about my son's, my daughter's needs to write goals, make sure that there is a sexuality goal in the IPP so that then the regional center has a responsibility to provide a service. If in the IPP there is no sexuality goal, then it is very likely you will not be getting a sexuality service, right? That goes for anything else. If your son needs employment support, but they don't have an employment goal, the, the regional center then has no responsibility, okay? So one, step number one is having an IPP meeting. Remember that you can request a meeting we suggest do it in writing, have evidence that they received it, whether you do that in person and they stamp it, or two, you send it by registered mail. They have 30 days to hold that meeting, okay? Based on the law, that meeting should take place within 30 days of your request. Number two, you have the right to record that meeting as long as you give 24-hour notice. So when you request the meeting in writing, Already, you can tell them, I plan to record this meeting. This is your notice, okay? Then in that meeting, go ready to discuss the needs, right? Be ready to develop goals and then be ready to ask for services, okay? And if they deny it, then if they deny it, meaning they say no or they do nothing, if they do nothing, like you're saying, a whole year has passed, technically they said no. Right. It's kind of like if, you know, someone asks someone to marry them. Right. Would you marry me? And the person says nothing. I think that means no. <laughs> right. So same goes here. I've asked for this service. You've said nothing. So I'm going to interpret that as a no. And I'm going to appeal your denial. And then this is how we get the ball rolling. OK. Another thing to consider. And we talked about this in the last group and it was pretty powerful because people started exchanging information and all of that. But let's say there is 20 of you, the 20 of you that are here in, in this training that say, oh man, we're from the same regional center and we all need this service. You all can attend a board of directors meeting for your regional center. One of you or a few of you can give public testimony and say, we are families here from this regional center. We all have teenagers or adults that for their health and safety, they require sex education. And there are 20 families here who are needing the same service. We would like the board to talk about how are you bringing in resources to the regional center to discuss this topic, right? Or to provide this service. So you could work on it on an individual level or you could work on it also simultaneously on a systemic level where we're calling attention to the board to the need for the provision of more providers for sexual education within that regional center. You guys could then go tour all the board meetings, right? If you'd like and go make this comment everywhere and say, hey, right? Abuse is rising. And you'll notice that in your presentation, I have given you some links um, for abuse, sex trafficking, maybe you research that a little bit and bring that data, right? Maybe demonstrate how these numbers are even higher among our community of people with disabilities and demonstrate given this, it's an urgent need for their health and safety, right? And we want to use the language that's in the law to press them even more on we need this for their health and safety. The law gives you a responsibility to provide services, to ensure and maintain health and safety. How are we doing that, right? And you get to advocate for that, okay? Awesome. Someone said, that's a great idea. A group of parents would be more influential to the regional center, yes. So my encouragement to you to work on it on an individual level, go have your IEPP meeting, go make sure you have a goal in there related to sexual education, OK, and then ask for the service, appeal it and simultaneously work on it systemically. Right. Bring parents together, go together and say this is necessary. And let me just a, a little more point on this before I, I go too off track. But 
keep in mind, systemic advocacy, like going to a board, requires consistency and patience, right? If you all just show up one time, it may not happen because you showed up and then went away and so the topic went away and so it's not really important, right? But if you consistently show up and say, last month we requested that this be put on the agenda for the board to talk about and it hasn't. We're again requesting that it be put for next month's agenda. Next month, I better be there and say either, thank you for putting it on the agenda. Thank you for discussing this, bravo. Or we are here for the third month in a row asking for this to be on the agenda and it still isn't. We gonna be here next month, right? Or whatever your, don't say it like that, but your strategy is then the consistency and the patience, okay? So um, coming back to, great question. Thank you for that. Um, Coming back to social circles, very important, okay? For many reasons, as we've looked at, okay? Now, keep in mind, as we talked about a little bit earlier, sometimes sexual energy is released in different ways that aren't sex. And again, you get to decide how your son or daughter gets to express, right, their sexuality. It could be through sex, but sometimes what they're looking for is intimacy, emotional, social intimacy. I remember um, I was in a session with a mom and her son, and I would see his her, their son uh, weekly, and he was about 17 years old. Um, and in the session, you know, he said, hey, Miss Sophie, uh, I want a girlfriend. And the mom kind of looked at me wide-eyed and was kind of like, redirect, redirect, <laughs> you know, redirect from the topic. Um, and I looked at him and I said, hey, wh what would that look like? Like you having a girlfriend, what would that look like? And I still chuckle because I, I still remember his face. He looked at me like, duh. He looked at me and said, go to the movies and share popcorn. Like that's what I would do with my girlfriend. And I was like, right. Okay, so you want a girlfriend to go to the movies with, share popcorn. Yeah, duh, right? So the mom's vision of a girlfriend was sex. And oh my God, I'm going to have to talk to him about the birds and the bees. And he better not get anybody pregnant. And he, right, all this download of worry and concern when all that her son was imagining was having a social intimate time with someone at the movies and sharing popcorn. And through that interaction, sexual energy is released without the sex part. Again, not to say that that part shouldn't exist, but when we're talking about teenagers, when we're talking about, oh, I don't know, right? Sometimes what we're looking for is the intimacy part, okay? And so sometimes because of our fear of the sex part, we limit opportunity for the other part right? When one, we can educate about the sex part and also create opportunities for the social part of it, okay? So intimate relationships, excuse me, could be physical, but they also could be social, emotional. Intimacy is found sometimes even more deeply through social interaction than even through sex, right? So um, and it's about also, you know, intimate relationships also could lead to reproduction and they have reproductive rights, right? Years ago, they would um, sterilize individuals with developmental or intellectual or disabilities in general, right? Because, oh, well, we don't want to reproduce. They have a disability, but our society and 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 luckily, right? grateful that we've evolved and that we're thinking and we're saying our kids aren't broken. They're literally just different, right? You're different. They have the right to reproduce if so they wish, right? And so sometimes because we don't present that as an option or we don't create opportunity for it, sometimes we see that our loved ones are lacking in that intimacy part. And sometimes because we are afraid of the sex part, but remember my, um, let's call him John. Let's remember John. His idea of a girlfriend was for social intimacy, 
Again, not that later on he wouldn't want that or wouldn't, but we get to educate him one step at a time, right? But what we're looking for is that intimacy. Now, let's say that physically a few of you answered, I'm not, I'm not actually sure that they can have sex. Maybe they have cerebral palsy and you're confused of, well, can they physically, can they, you know, can they have sex? That would be one part, right? And we have to educate on that part. Um, but let's say that a person currently does not have access to engage in a sexual relationship and or doesn't have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, right? Then what are other things that we can do to support that person in still having a full life, right? So before I go more into that, um, let's look at the options, right? And again, this is a menu and a spectrum of options. You get to educate, right? And you get to decide what your family believes, condones, and wants to encourage, right? In terms of your son or daughter. So what are the options for exploring and spending, if you would, sexual energy? One, actual sex, right? Having a, a partner, a consensual partner, that would have sex. Another option would be masturbation. Visual images, there are sex surrogates even, right? Not so much in this state, um, okay? But sex, masturbation, visual images, sex surrogates, those are options, right? Now, within these options, there still would need to be some education and some parameters, right? To remain safe, to make options if they are going to have sex, are they looking to reproduce? Do they need to know about birth or they need to know about birth control, about different options, right? Whatever your option that you think is appropriate for how your son or daughter could explore and spend this energy, there needs to be a plan, right? In order to ensure their health and safety. Now, Keeping in mind that in society, there is a range, right? There are individuals who choose to practice, right, sex, and there are individuals who, who believe in abstinence. It's a spectrum. So whether you're on this side of the spectrum or whether you're on the abstinent side of the spectrum, a plan needs to be made. If you're on the abstinent part of the spectrum, then discussing, then what other outlets do I have for this sexual energy? right? What other options, what other things can I be doing to express this sexual energy, waste this sexual energy? What are my options? Either side of a spectrum, a conversation needs to be had, a plan should be discussed to ensure health and safety. I recall um, there was a gentleman who, you know, the, the mom was saying, you know, I, I, I think that that he masturbates, but what occurred is because there were no parameters, it actually became a very obsessive behavior, right? And in a way, well, that could make sense, right? We tend to increase, we repeat behaviors that feel good, right? And so this became a very repetitive activity for him. Unfortunately, it was causing, he was hurting himself. Right. And there was also some infections occurring due to the lack of hygiene when he did this. Right. So either way that we go, there needs to be boundaries, parameters and education around this. Right. So now if we're on the more abstinent side of the spectrum, then we're looking at what else can happen. These social connections. Right. These social connections. Being able to communicate and have support, right? Some individuals say exercise. You know, I think it's even become a funny phrase, right? When someone experiences something physically, when they see someone and they say, hey, buddy, go walk it off, go walk, right? It's even a joke, but it's exercise, right? It's exercise. It's engaging in something else whenever this isn't an option, right? So, um, Lastly, someone having more control over their life and independence may slightly, I don't want to say fully, but may slightly contribute to them being more satisfied in life.
But can you imagine a person who doesn't have access to social relationships, doesn't have access to a sexual partner or to that part of their life, and also doesn't have control over their life, doesn't choose what they're going to eat, doesn't choose what they're going to wear, doesn't choose where they want to go during the day, we're going to end up with a very frustrated person. And then we might ask ourselves, wow, I wonder why they're so aggressive. I wonder why, how would we be if we had no access to certain things and then our life was very limited, right? Now, <clears throat> Um, I want us to, to keep in mind this topic of being single, this topic of not having access or not having a partner for sexual activity. Let's take off the disability lens and let's normalize the fact that there are people in this situation that don't have a disability. There are single people without a sexual partner, right? who are in the same situation as your loved one with a disability. And so sometimes we hyper-focus on they're single because they have a disability, right? Well, not necessarily. It's rough out here, <laughs> right? Some people may say, well, I don't have a disability. I'm single. It's tough out here. I don't know, right? So sometimes we over-focus on it's the disability part when it's not. But I'd like to say, right, there are individuals who say, man, I, I do want to be married and I'm sometimes kind of a little bum that I'm not and that I, I don't have a partner. But man, I love my job. I, I go on vacations twice a year. I do whatever I want. I go out with my friends. And there's something that although this is lacking and maybe they want that for their life, they're enjoying other parts of their life. And so it makes the part that you can't have a little bit more bearable, right? And maybe there are people who say, I, I actually, I'm totally okay being single. Don't want it, actually. I, I'm enjoying this way too much, right? So the idea is, what can we do, right, to support our sons and our daughters to thrive in other areas of their life, especially in the event that this part of their life takes a little longer to take off, right? That love doesn't come, that the sex uh, you know, a sexual partner doesn't come, that if this doesn't happen, how can we enhance other parts of their life? Okay, so questions to reflect on, you know, how do you know if your son or daughter has questions about sex or relationships? Number one, let's create space for it. Let's ask them, right? Some people use the word sex. Do you know what that means? Open-ended, right? open-ended and also checking our facial affect when we ask these questions, right? You don't know about sex, do you? And that's different than me being open and saying some people use, some people say the word, or there's the word sex. What do you, what comes to mind when you hear that word? What do you know about that word, right? A very neutral affect versus one that already is introducing a little bit of judgment and a little bit of self-perception to that conversation, right? Right. What behaviors do you see as a parent that may indicate sexual frustration? Okay. Sometimes, and this gets a little bit, a little bit of a touchy uh, subject, but I worked with some families who the mom told me, Sophie, I see my son and he approaches me and he kind of looks at my breasts and wants to touch and wants to, and it gets a little bit blurry. But one thing I would always comment, I would say, you know, you're the only woman that they have access to. You're the only man that they have access to. And so um, it's not to normalize the fact that they should be attracted to their mom or they should be, it's not to, to condone that part, but it's to say that behavior lets us know they're curious about this. You're just the only woman they have access to. You're the only man they have access to. And so this inappropriate behavior is happening, but it's really an indication that they need to know more, right? What differences may exist between the expression of sexual interest as demonstrated by males versus women, right? What would be different? Sometimes we attribute this uh, arousal or sex to only men, right? Because it may look different in girls. How might it look different? But we might be missing it because girls display it differently, 
Okay. What might work for you to explore these areas and these topics with your son or daughter, right? How might this begin? With this, I want to bring up the fact um, there's a um, theory, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that says that our needs as humans are like a pyramid. And at the bottom of our needs are physiological needs. Then we have safety needs. Then we have the need to be loved and belong, which include friendship and family and a sense of connection. Then Maslow's theory says that then we have the need for esteem, to feel respected, to have status, to be recognized, to, be, to have freedom. And then lastly, we have the need for self-actualization. So the desire to become the most that one can be. I bring this to light here because sometimes for our community with individuals with disabilities, we focus so much, rightfully so, but we focus so much on the physiological needs and the safety needs. And as long as those are met, we sometimes don't consider or think about or work toward the other needs that this pyramid describes. So if you see here to the left, we sometimes only focus on the needs that will allow us to survive. Only health and safety. I'm surviving. But we don't always focus for our loved ones with disabilities on the growing and thriving part. They may be well and alive, but do they feel loved and like they belong? Do they feel a sense of esteem because they're part of something bigger than themselves? This is where something like employment may come in. Hobbies may come in. Being things as part of a team, right? Do they have this opportunity? And then self-actualization. Are they known for something? Right. I remember I used to work with a um, young woman. She was about 20 at that time and she did not want to work. Right. She didn't want to work. Excuse me. And her grandmother was her caretaker and really pushed her to work. And then something unlocked for her. And through her job, which she worked at a Taco Bell, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was Taco Bell and Pizza Hut. They're like a branch together. And so she started working there. And she started getting friends, right? Employment became more than just the income, right? She started making friends. And then, funny enough, during our sessions, in order for her to work on flexibility and patience and following directions, we would bake pizzas together. Um, and it was something fun and something that would help her work toward her goals. So she actually became the pizza maker at the pizza hut that was connected with the Taco Bell, right? And so very, and she made them really well. And very soon she became known as the pizza girl. And she became like, oh, she makes the best pizzas. And it, it was true, right? She made really good pizzas. And so her life, I wanna say changed. She started not just surviving, she started growing and thriving. And she was doing things in her life that she felt good about, right? She too wanted a partner and wanted to explore her sexuality. But, right, while that happened for her, she was getting more and more satisfied with her life because of other things and other activities, right? So the importance of introducing social connections and other opportunities for our children, right? For our sons, for our daughters. So things like new experiences, as we talked about, hobbies, connection, independence, help them identify their emotions so that they can tell you when they feel sad, that they can tell you when they feel angry or disappointed, help them identify their strengths. Within disability culture, we focus so much on what they can't do. Right, but how can we be more strength based? How can we be more person centered? How can we work on employment that uses their strength, like this young woman? Do they like photography? How can we turn that into a thing? Right? And to do that, how can we add responsibilities? Right? 
responsibilities and chores sometimes seem like a burden something like, oh, I'm going to spare them from having to do this stuff. But really, it creates a sense of autonomy and it creates opportunities to develop skills that could help them tomorrow for employment. Right. So how can you help your son or daughter build social connection? How can they feel less alone? Maybe you have struggled with the thought of them having a boyfriend or girlfriend, right? Having a partner. But now, right, you realize, wow, well, what if that only meant they want to go to the movies and share popcorn, right? And maybe play a game after, go for a walk, go to the gym together, right? Social connection, okay? Now, it's interesting that when we, you know, talk with individuals with disabilities, Again, we often think when they say boyfriend, girlfriend, we think, oh boy, they're going to ask all the sex questions, right? They're going to ask about all these things. But really, um, there's a, a gentleman, um, and he actually has passed away in, in past recent past years. But his, Dave is, his name is Dave Hingsberger, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, and he dedicated a lot of his life to um, working with individuals with disabilities and working on this part of sexuality. And what he reports is that he doesn't, he didn't get questions about sex. He got questions like, how can I get a boyfriend or girlfriend? How do I know if they like me? How do I know if they're just trying to take advantage of me? Where can I meet compatible partners? What is a good age to enter a relationship? right? They had more questions about that than the other stuff, right? Than even the sex part. And so the first step is that social connection, right? And then when we come to think of it, maybe yes, as a parent, you're afraid of them being taken advantage of, of them getting hurt. But very gently, I ask, didn't that happen to us all? Disability or no disability, didn't some of us get taken advantage of? Haven't we all kind of gotten our heart broken? But eventually, maybe that led to then us finding beautiful experiences and experiencing love, right? This had to happen. We had to learn before we got to this part. And for some of us, it's taken different directions, right? Maybe it started good, then it got, there's a gamut of experiences, right? But sometimes the fear of the disappointment gets in the way of us creating the opportunity for them to experience and for them to experience something that could end up being very beautiful, right? So I want to take some time to um, share this video. Give me one second. I'm going to share again so that I can share with sound. Okay, and let me know if you can hear that, okay. And this is a video with um, the gentleman, Dave um, Hangsberger. Everyone can see a beige screen. Awesome. Can you all- Folks with disabilities would come to me and they'd say, oh, I, I want a boyfriend or I want a girlfriend and my mom says no and my dad says no, would you go talk to my mom and dad? So I always did. I would go and talk to their parents and I'd sit down and I'd, you know, talk to them and reason with them and their children were adults and so forth. You know, I never, ever, ever convinced one parent to change their mind. Not one. Okay. So I just thought, well, of course, parents are very difficult. And finally, I realized I was going in, I was sitting down and with my mouth, I was saying their child was competent. But by being there speaking for their child, I was saying that they weren't. Okay. So I thought what I really needed to do was not do it anymore. That what I needed to do was don't do work for my client that doesn't belong to me. I'm walking through sheltered industry and this guy comes out and he says, you know, he knew I, I taught sex education and he said he wanted a girlfriend would I go talk to his mom. And I said, no, I don't do that anymore. And he got all upset. I said, well, no, hold on. I'll, I'll meet with you and, and I'll work with you and I'll get you ready. And and then you can go talk to your mom. Now, I'll drive you and I'll be with you if you want, but it's your job, right? And he got real upset. And I said to him, what I now believe, if you can't tell your parents you want a relationship, you probably shouldn't have one. You know, because assertion is a really big part about what it is to be an adult and sexually safe. So, so he agrees to come and see me. 
so we're we're doing some role plays and and I'm sort of getting him to talk about what relationships mean to him and and all that sort of stuff. Um, and but man, he's nervous, right? So I go I go to the office and I was talking to my boss and I said, well, I'm doing the new process and she said, well, who who, who is it? Who are you doing it with? So I told her. She said, do you know who his mother is? And I'm like, no. You see, his mother married, had him, then later divorced, remarried, different last name. And if I said political parent, you know what I mean by that, okay? She'd be on the phone in an instant, right? But, oh, great. So nonetheless, now I'm, now I'm really practicing with him because she's tough. And um, he comes in and he says, okay, I want, I, I want to talk to my mom this week. And I'm like, you are so not ready. And he's like, no, 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 I'm ready. I said, no, no, you're not ready. And he said, no, I'm ready. And it takes me a while to realize he's standing up to me now, so maybe he's ready. So I said, why now? And he said, well, there's a dance coming up, and he wants to take a girl to the dance, and he won't do it without his mother's approval. So all right, he's got the motivation. So we set a, an appointment. So we go over to meet his mom. And, uh, and I go with him because he really wanted me to go, and we knock on the door, and, and she opens the door, and she's done the job of getting mad, and we haven't even started, you know. She knew, she, she had a good idea why we were there. So we came in and, and sat down, and I said, your son has something to say. And of course, she's looking at me, and I said, no, no, I, I, I'm just here to provide transportation. So she turns to him, and, and you know, I had done all of this work with him, all the stuff that he should say and all that. He didn't do any of it. He just threw it out the window. He said, Mom, do you know that I love you? And, he, and she was totally unprepared for that. So she actually yelled at him. Of course I do, she says. He said, so, Mom, you, you don't want me to love someone else. Is that because you're afraid there won't be any left for you, Mom? And I was like, that was good. That was good. In an instant, I disappeared. And they ended up having this, this amazing conversation. And, of course, she realized if he was competent at loving her, as a child, why wouldn't he be competent at loving someone else? And, and I think that what I really learned from that, um, why is our voice heard when their voice is necessary? Powerful stuff, yes? Right. So many things to to consider here. Right. One, the fact that he's so right. Right. Sometimes um, we just need to create opportunities for our sons and daughters to be able to express themselves, to be able to make these requests. Um, and the fact that they have right the right to experience these relationships that maybe he hit the nailed on the head with saying, man, what, why are we so afraid of our children exploring, right? And, and falling in love, right? And loving other people other than us. And so, so many things to consider with this video. I really encourage you to uh, research a little bit more on um, Dave's work. Um, and it, it introduces many things to think about, right? So, you know, when we think about our children dating, when we think about our sons or daughters dating, then, you know, we want to maybe introduce some questions of what are they looking for from a relationship, right? What are their expectations for marriage? What personal boundaries would they like to practice, right? In, in the dating world, those, there's, there are so many, there's etiquette and, and expectations. You know, it could be small things, but it's where we might start of what do you want to wear, right, on your first date? Who's going to pay? Who's going to drive? Do you want to have sexual or physical intimacy on the first date or not? Do you know about birth controls? Do you know about keeping your body safe and exams like pap smears and prostate tests? And do you know about sexually transmitted? There's so much to talk about, right? Let me tell you about dating conflicts. Do you know about love triangles? You know, what things can happen among dating? There's so much to talk about, all in due time. But recognizing dating is involved, right? There's so much that goes into dating. 
so there's so much to to talk about pardon me i'm gonna skip through here not sure why i did that right so there's so much to explore so much to talk about with our sons or daughters now in these conversations we may need communication tools whether your son or daughter is verbal or less has less uh verbal communication right what tools can you incorporate to talk about these things right on a scale of 1 to 5 right how much are you off, are, are you currently thinking about wanting a boyfriend right one meaning ugh, never right five meaning all the time i really want a boyfriend right how can we use these scales and these communication charts to get to know our son or daughter more right keeping in mind we're not going to start using these scales about this topic not necessarily we're going to start first using it about more mundane stuff i remember when i first um would introduce this kind of scale um, to a person that I was working with, we would go to um, an ice cream shop, right? Yogurt Land, Baskin Robbins were our favorites, right? So let's say we go to Yogurt Land and we would choose three flavors, right? Chocolate, vanilla, mango, let's say. Even if the individual was nonverbal, right? And they had never used this scale. Whenever I gave them the flavor of vanilla, maybe they smelled it kind of looked at it, maybe tasted it a little bit, looked at it, and then got a spoon and ate it slowly. Even if he or she could not tell me with their words how they felt about that ice cream, I would say, huh, right? You looked like you liked that out of three. You didn't seem totally excited about it, but you ate it. You didn't finish it. So it looks like you kind of liked it. Then I would give them chocolate and <laughs> my goodness, they almost ate the cup. I think they like it out of five, right? And then mango, they smelled it and said, no, thank you. <laughs> I think you don't like mango, right? And so that would be out of one. Today, we may use these scales to talk about ice cream flavors, pizza, what do you want to wear? What kind of weather do you like? But tomorrow, right, with now some familiarity with with tools like this we can use it to have really profound conversations right how comfortable are you being physically intimate on your first date do you want to or not on a scale of one to five if you've used scales like this for long then it becomes a valid method of communication for whatever topic you want to talk about right? When we use communication tools, sometimes we get very used to just yes and no, right? Do you like this? Yes or no. And really, even if we say, hey, are you hungry? Do you ever answer yes or no? I know I don't. You know what? I, I kind of am, but like if I feel like eating something fresh and like if you want to share, then I would be down for eating something. But if not, then I'm okay. That wasn't yes or no. Right. So sometimes we need to expand the choices that we give them to communicate, to include yes, no, but also maybe. Also, I don't know. Also, I need more time to think about it. You're asking me about dating and sex. I need more time to think about it. I don't know. I need help. I don't understand the question. I have something else on my mind. I need more information on this topic. Right. With simple tools like this we could expand the range of communication with our sons or daughter. Also keep in mind, just because your son or daughter is verbal, doesn't mean that we can't benefit from tools like this. Because when it, ta when it comes to the topic of dating and sex and sexuality, they may not want to talk. They may turn a little nonverbal because they're shy. Right. I remember one of the best conversations, one of the best sessions I had with a, a young girl was from across a door, passing a paper like this back and forth under the door and tools like this about how she was feeling happy, nervous, angry, excited. This is how we communicated for about an hour and 15 minutes. She told me more using these papers than if we would have talked face to face, right? So these tools are so important. 
Lastly, right, exploring outcome options with them. And let me explain what, what that would be. So I, I, I hear you and I always like to say, I'm not a parent. So I don't mean to tell you, oh, I totally understand. Just let them go. Let them, I don't know what that feels like, right? I, I could only imagine how hard it is. And I could only imagine how hard it is to consider and think about your son or daughter being hurt or being taken advantage of by someone else. So how can I support my son or daughter so that they could still explore but be safe? Helping them think about what can happen, right? So my role as a therapist at times was I, I developed this one through five scale where we would identify, you're about to do this. What do you think is the range of things that could happen. So for example, um, the gentleman who wanted a girlfriend to watch movies with and um, share popcorn with, he um, loved giving gifts for Valentine's Day, right? And he was gonna use that day to ask a girl out on a date. And of course, the mom was very concerned. He was also nervous of like, what is she gonna say? So we developed a one through five scale. One, represented the best case scenario, right? What would be the best case scenario? And then number five was the worst case scenario. So you're gonna ask a girl out on a date. What would be the best case scenario, right? And we played it out. And he said, well, the best case scenario would be her telling me, I like you. I would love to go on a date with you and maybe a kiss on the cheek. Okay, so under number one, we would write that response. And I said, you're going to ask a girl out. She could tell you that. You could have the best outcome. What would be another option? A little less perfect, but what could be still a good option? Maybe her saying, um, I, um, maybe her saying, um, sure. I don't know you much, but sure. I'm willing to go out on a date with you, right? She didn't say like, oh, love you too, but you know, she's open. So there's hope. Right. So that was outcome number two. Then I would say, what's outcome number three? What would be like a so so response for you? Saying, um, her saying, I don't like you, but you're a nice friend. So what if we just like have lunch sometimes in the lunch benches and like be friends? Okay. So she didn't say no to your date in this scenario. I mean, she didn't say yes to your date but she's open to being friends. That's that's neither here or there, but that's cool, right? Not the worst, not the best, but it's in the middle. Then four, um, and he himself expressed these, right? And I said, what would be like a not so good response? For her to say, heck no, uh-uh, ew, that would be, and we processed that. I said, how would you feel if she said that, right? And then what did we use? These scales, <laughs> right? What did we use? Emotion charts. How would you feel if number four happened, right? And then what would be the worst? And he answered, right? And said, well, if she looked at me and said, you're a weirdo. No one would ever want to go out with you. Ew. That was in his mind, the worst case scenario. And I think I agree, right? Through doing this, we were able to help him mentally prepare for the outcomes all while remaining in hope, right? That something good would happen, but prepared him because the truth is there is a range of outcomes that could occur. But if we can help prepare them for the different options, then maybe that would be good. Maybe they would be less hurt, more prepared, more cautious, right? And let me tell you, when I first used this scale, we didn't use it when it was about a sensitive topic about dating. We first used it when he wanted to ask his mom if she would buy him a video game. So we went through the same exercise. What's the best case scenario? Tell me case scenario number one. If my mom would say, absolutely, son, let's get in the car. Let's go to Target right now and buy it for you. That would be number one right? So we went through this mental rehearsal for other things before we applied it to the dating scenario, right? So using um, uh, charts, using communication tools like this, encouraging them to talk about things, and maybe, just maybe, 
If you feel that they would benefit from speaking to someone else, then maybe helping them set that up as well. Maybe a therapist, maybe some kind of counselor or a life coach or something through regional center or through school, right? What can they have? Okay, so using these communication tools. There is lots of abuse prevalence among people with intellectual disabilities. So again, when we talk about all this sexuality um, and inclusion, them in the community is a human right. And we're doing it also for preventative reasons. So we're doing it for um, you know, to allow them to thrive and experience life to the fullest, which includes their sexuality. And we're also doing it for the health and safety component of it. Okay. Excuse me. So what can we do to support our, our loved ones in this area? Sexual education, personal about their own body and relational about inner physical interaction with another person. Establishing communication methods, establishing a reporting method. Do your kids know how to tell you if something goes wrong, if someone touches them, if someone says something, if someone has an approach that is inappropriate, do we have a reporting method? Okay, maybe these scales can help. Increase opportunity to practice self-advocacy. Right. What do you want to wear? You choose what we're going to watch in TV today. You choose what we're having for dinner. We're having pizza, but you get to choose where from. Right. Do we make it? Do we buy it? If we buy it, do we get it from Pizza Hut, Domino's? OK. Um, and, and for self-confidence, how can we increase that? Right. Look for appropriate services and supports. Expand their social circle and explore other things right? Help them practice self-advocacy. Help them know how to represent themselves, their viewpoints, and their interests. Even if they're nonverbal, you can use tools, right, to help them be in touch with themselves and express themselves. Not only survive, right? Are you hungry? What do you need to eat? Are you cold? Are you hurt? No, but what do you like in life? What kind of day is a good day for you? right? What do you want for your future? That kind of conversation. Remembering the, the, the pyramid, not just surviving, but growing and thriving, right? How can we engage in conversations that will help in that? Okay. And then as we mentioned a little earlier with the question that was asked, services and supports focused on health and safety, right? Services in school, make sure they have sexual education related goals in their IEP. If not, they're not going to give them a service. Okay. Services in the home and community that would be for regional center under IPP. Again, make sure they have a goal related to that area. And even so you may request a service and they may deny it. Right. So consider your option to appeal. Consider your option to do complaints if they're appropriate, right? And what other services and supports? Maybe there's a youth group at your church. Maybe the community center does dances. Maybe you've learned of a, a self-advocate group that has game nights. Maybe we expose them to that more. Maybe we prepare them. Maybe we get a support staff that will take them because, you know, mom and dad should probably not go with them to the dance right? Because they want to explore it and be teenagers and adults, right? So who can support them in that? Okay. Here at the end of the presentation, I've left you with a few resources. Okay. You could also look on Google and type in something like books about physical development, books about puberty, and other keywords that can, that will come up, you know, resources will come up that you could use for um, you know, the sex education part of it. Okay. Um, thank you for your attention to this conversation, for your participation. Mm -hmm. And um, this marks the end of our formal presentation. And thanks for watching if you watch this a little later. And um, we will go into questions in just a little bit now. Okay. Thank you so much, Sophia. That was, it's eye-opening. The last time you did this one for us was two years ago, and my kids were a lot smaller. Now they're 
full fledged 17 and 14 year olds. Yeah. So this really hits home for me. <laughs> it, it, it means something different now, huh? Oh, yeah, so different. Are okay, you... I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording so we can stop 